Hi everyone, Richard here at uh, Calvin Wazoo. And certainly strange times. It is Sunday afternoon here. Chicago was on curfew last night from 9 until 6. We're going to probably be on curfew again. A lot of, a lot of stuff going on. And as expected, perhaps, the police are going to be there in a show of force. Because we can't have people expressing outrage, can we? So, yeah, difficult, difficult days. And uh, beguiling days at that. Beautiful day outside here. It's, it's quiet. And uh, things, however, may heat up again tonight in Chicago. You know, we'll see. But this is about Vinyl in the Mail. Another episode of Vinyl in the Mail, and what I had ordered this time was something by a band that I had only recently and accidentally discovered. It's a band called Slint, and I happened across uh, a video, which I have linked in the Down Under, um, of a session where the band members are doing a demo video rehearsal of uh, one of their signature songs that would uh, eventually be released on their final album. Good Morning Captain is the name of the song. And I was watching it and uh, mesmerized but they, they were kids, essentially. Although at the time of recording Spider-Land, you know, they were, they were older, they were college age. But the more I began to learn about these guys in this band from Louisville, uh, I realized that, you know, they were kids, essentially, when they got started. And they had several bands that they put together and um, they even toured, played clubs, you know, while they were, you know, 15, 16 years old. And they were a pretty tight-knit group of guys that uh, uh, were, you know, they were all friends as well as, you know, musicians. Um, but when I heard that song... Good morning, Captain. It was like, what am I listening to? Truly amazing. Um, truly amazing. And with each listen, this stuff just continually gets better because while initially you might think of their musical style as being very grunge, distorted, oriented music, there's a lot of thought that they put into their songs and their construction. Well, I now own their entire discography, starting with their debut album, Tweez, all right, which was released in 1989. This was followed up with Spiderland, which was released in 1994, or excuse me, 91, 91. And then they um, had an EP that, uh, just two song EP, uh, untitled, and that was released in 1994. That's their entire discography. 
so when you buy the new re-releases of Spider-Land, it comes with a DVD that includes a documentary um, that is known as, um, ah, drawn a blank here now. Oh yeah, Breadcrumb Trail, Breadcrumb Trail, which is also the opening song on the release of uh, Spider-Land. And you learn some interesting things about this band. Now, they're categorized as math rock, which was a term that I kind of heard used before, but I really was unfamiliar with it. But essentially, you know, how the description, you know, in Wikipedia or whatever, is that it's a uh, musical style that is very percussive oriented in which the other instruments, guitar, etc., sort of take the background or are no soaring, you know, guitar solos or anything like that. Um, and even lyrics tend to be withdrawn into the background. Everything is being guided by uh, the percussion. That was really something I noticed when I watched that YouTube video of the demo for Good Morning Captain. The drummer was, his style was so I can't even really think of the word. It was like he was in control of everything that was happening. He wasn't there merely to keep rhythm. He was directing the progression of the song. And the rhythm is not a simple 4-4 four, four or something like that. It is, a, it is a complex rhythm that shifts throughout many of their songs. And you get these crescendos, you know, of, that seem to build up tension. And then the tension is released and then the song kind of drops back. Um, and, and, and then the tension can repeat itself. And this is kind of their signature sound, I guess you could say. The principles in Slint are the drummer, um, Britt Walford, and then guitar player, Brian McMahon. And these guys knew each other since grade school and were great friends. They even went together to kind of a magnet school, very arts-oriented school that um, was not a traditional style of education program. This was in Louisville, Kentucky, and probably had a lot to do with their creative energy being rewarded and allowed to explore. These guys were in bands by the time they were 14 years old, and they were playing gigs. They weren't just, you know, garage bands. They were playing gigs. And um, even under various names, you know, uh, kind of toured to, to clubs and would show up at these venues where, you know, they're 14 and 15 years old, hanging out with, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds um, in, from other bands, etc. So these guys were um, in the scene and at least when you, if you, you know, you should watch the video. I've, I've got a link to the documentary in the down under because the whole documentary is also on YouTube. Um, you should watch it because it's, it's pretty interesting about their background and how they had this sense of self that kind of allowed them to hang with these, with these older people. Um, and, uh, not necessarily be crushed or even exploited um, by uh, any of the others that they encountered. Britt and 
Brian apparently also went to Northwestern after they graduated high school. So Northwestern in the suburb, Chicago suburb of Evanston. Um, and that's, you know, that's not an easy school to get into. Plus it's a pretty expensive school. And I think probably, you know, they got, um, got there on scholarship and they both kind of realized that while it was an interesting learning experience, they didn't come from the same background a lot of the other students did. Um, and they were engaged in, you know, all kinds of shenanigans or whatever. But while they were up there, that's when they uh, met some people uh, who could help them in terms of recording. And then that's when they did this album, their debut, Tweez. And... Um, Interesting, you know, label. It's not a side A or side B. Uh, Bemis, the Bemis side is side A. And then the Gerber side is side B. The This album is, it's kind of a fun little sophomoric in in the sense that it, you know there's a lot of like kidding jokes or things like that that are kind of going that go into it um it uh the names of the songs are like ron nanding carol charlotte those are the names of the songs because the band members came up with this idea that they would title the songs after their parents um, except for the one song, Rhoda, uh, which is a dog. That was Brick's dog. So that's how, you know, they came up with this. Then, you know, they took a photo of this sob on this, on this road, and then they photoshopped it so that it could say the name of the album here in the grill, Tweez. And then um, here's the band name, Slint. You know, got photoshopped uh, into it. So they recorded this and mixed it in like 1987 in Evanston, Illinois, and then it was released in 1989. You know, you, you can see they're kidding. This was engineered by some fucking dirt niffer. Um, yeah, so uh, kind of funny, kind of funny. And it's kind of a, it, it, it's a, it's still that kind of dirty, distorted, uh, kind of noisy rock, but that math rock element is still in there because Brit's drumming is still definitely the the structure on which the songs are pretty much built. But the overall tone of the song is is more you know playful you know a bit. Kind of reminds me of Poster Children's uh, album, it, and they were a contemporary uh, Poster Children's album. Daisy Chain Reaction. Now, the other members of the band included uh, David Pajo, who was also on guitar. Uh, Brian was on guitar also. Then there's Ethan Buckler, who's on bass. And then Todd, uh, excuse me, um, right, they were the other two, David Pajo and Ethan Buckler. Now, Ethan ended up leaving the band after this album was released because he didn't like the production. He didn't like the way the final mix sounded. And it upset him enough that uh, he ended up quitting the band. So after Ethan left, Todd Brashear joined the group and, for, as bass player. And then he was involved in the development of their next album, Spiderland. This one here, which was released in 1991. Um, this quarry is where, you know, they would swim. Um, so Spiderland became legend. The tone and atmosphere is much darker than Tweez. 
and it has still that same quality and technique where the band will, you know, take like a theme and it's kind of a quiet moment and then they will build it up in intensity in, in which the guitars, you know, are just really screeching and the distortion is heavy and then the, everything kind of like, ah, there's this release and they pull back and uh, into like a quiet mode and then build up again, you know, with this strong release. Um, but still, the musical tone and timbre in Spiderland combined now also with the lyrics is a much darker album. So the first song, Bread Come Trail, which is also the name of the documentary that I have a link to in the Down Under, is kind of a, it describes a day at a carnival with this fortune teller. And um, again, there's this, as you're listening to the narrator or speaker of the song, um, who is Brian, uh, you know, it's, you sense that there's this, there is this underlying tension and also something kind of like creepy going on. Then the next song is Nosferatu Man, which uh, is named after the uh, silent film of the uh, 19, actually 1922. Um, so that was the inspiration there. This is followed by a song called Don Aman which is really Don, a man. So it's, even though you can see that it's Don and then Amon as in one word, but it's Don, a man. And again, now this one, Walford, Britt Walford does the vocals. Um, and he is decidedly childish or you know, his voice sounds uh, the, the, you know, I won't say evil, but just sounds peculiar as, you know, he's reciting. And a lot of these songs are not sung. The lyrics are spoken word lyrics and they're telling stories. And you definitely, you need to listen to this over and over again, you know, to start getting the gist uh, of the stories. But this is another one that everything just starts to build up and then the tension is released and then it repeats the cycle of building up the tension. This is, in fact, part of the reason why, while they did play gigs in live venues um, as Slint, um, it's not the kind of music that goes over well live because of these very, very quiet parts. Um, then the next song is Washer, which this is an example of that. It just quietly fades in from like complete silence. It's, that's not a song you can necessarily recreate you know, in a live venue in the same way, because the intention is there to build this distortion or build this tension that, that climaxes in a lot of distortion with the guitars. Um, and all, you know, there's no soaring guitar solos. You know, there's some simple riffs, but they're, they're very, very simple and rhythmic. And that's, uh, and again, the time signatures in these songs are, um, you know, they're not they're not constant. Um, and then this is followed by an instrumental called "For Dinner." Um, and so after that comes essentially the signature piece, which is "Good Morning, Captain." Now this was inspired by a poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The poem is The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And that poem 
if you look it up and, and read uh, the poem, you'll see that um, if you've ever heard the euphemism or phrase about people having an albatross around their neck, comes from that poem, as well as the sing-songy, childish verse of water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. That also comes from that poem. So the story in Good Morning Captain is a little bit similar. In the former, it, the story is this seafaring man shows up and he starts talking to a stranger about what happened to him at sea. And the stranger initially is, you know, initially entry, but gets bothered and upset, but gradually becomes really absorbed in the story being told, you know, by verse. So in uh, Good Morning Captain, it's kind of similar where we have this captain supposedly showing up at some house, you know, explaining that he's a survivor of a shipwreck and he's looking for shelter. And while he's resting in this house, this child climbs up uh, from the outside, I, I believe, in the window and, and peers in and it really disturbs the man. You know, he's kind of lying in bed in this reverie and then he sees this child and um, it really alarms him. But things are really kind of ambiguous at this time. And then the music is just building and building and building in intensity to where um, uh, Brian is screaming, screaming out. I miss you, I miss you, and the screams are these guttural, animalistic screams, while the rest of the band is just building into this enormous crescendo, and, and this is, a, I think it was a live recording, so he's, Brian has to just really, really scream to have his voice heard over all this, this noise, but it's not just an effort to be heard, you, you sense that he's just really, he's dug down really deep inside of him to pull out some kind of demon or something and to, to scream this out, I miss you, I miss you. And the words are pretty ambiguous, you know, who does he miss? Does he miss the, the child that appeared in the window? Who is that child? Is that child him as a younger person? Um, is this child a his progeny? You know, it's there's some ambiguity there. And the intensity of that finish is so strong that reportedly, according to a number of sources, including the documentary DVD, um, is that right after that, because he was screaming so hard, Brian vomited. Well, he didn't just vomit. Oh, I can't remember, maybe a week or so after recording the album, he checked himself into a hospital. And that was it. That was the, essentially the end of the band. So they had created this record that, you know, nothing on the front. I mean, there was some text on the back. But, um, you know, the band, it, it broke up right after they recorded. So there was no touring no promotions, just a very quiet release. So needless to say, it didn't catch on very well. But over the years, it kind of, by word of mouth, started to sell more and more. And each year it would sell, you know, more copies than the year before. 
And I think now it's probably sold somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 copies. So over time too, some, you know, it started to get some critical acclaim. Cer certainly there were people um, who were familiar with Ben. There was the underground fan base that um, continued to, you know, buy and listen to and share the album. And gradually the music industry started to pay attention to using words to describe it such as majestic, a singular achievement, one of the most important indie albums of the 1990s. Now there were some detractors, in particular Robert Christgau, um, a music critic who perhaps at times is famous for his negative reviews and his sharp tongue when he writes them. And he said the album was, quote, art rockers without the courage of their pretension, end quote, with really poor lyrics. So there was a lot of, you know, mixed reaction. And it didn't help either that even like during the times of Tweez, and they played, you know, live venues uh, before they recorded this album. But, um, and, and so they were, they had played some of the songs on that album, uh, on Spider-Land, I should say, uh, to live venues before, such as bars or something like that. But they weren't the most dynamic live act. They would get on stage and they basically wouldn't move. They would simply be playing their instruments, staring at their feet. So, you know, it's, uh, their music though really is not suited for a live venue like others have, have said, because it's really, you gotta listen to it. Um, it's kind of a thinking man's rock, even though it's going to sound like, you know, grunge and distortion, but there's a, a lot more going on with that music. They did play the Pitchfork Festival here in Chicago in 2007. So they got together again and they were also playing, um, you know, a few times, you know, regrouped and, and playing again. But it's the same situation, you know, when they would get on stage, there'd be, uh, the fans would be very excited that they're showing up and they're going to play, but then they're up there and they're just standing there looking at their feet, playing their music. So it's not really well suited for a live show. And, you know, another interesting thing is that all the band members had, since dispersing him, remained um, busy in the music industry. Britt Walford, the drummer, one of the founding members, you might note, was with the Breeders. Uh, he recorded with them, but it was under the pseudonym of Shannon Doughton. So it's not his name that shows up in the credits uh, on their albums or in, in other uh, reports when uh, the breeders were touring. But it was noticeable, you know, that in this all-female group, he was the only male person. And, uh, and he was going by the name of Shannon Doughton. But it was, it was him, Britt Walford. Um, they never promoted the album. They never toured. But nonetheless, it just kept growing and growing and growing. The, this EP release for uh, many years, it, um, it never said, you know, what was on it. The songs were uh, not identified, but their songs from two of the song, the two songs are from Tweez, although one of them, I think it's Rhoda, is a different mix.
So, yeah, I'm still listening to them. I'm still listening and developing a fuller grasp of these albums. And like I say, Tweez and Spiderland are two very different. They're, they have a similar base, but they're in terms of personality, they're very different albums. But they're both really, really good. Um, if you're not familiar with Slint, um, you should check them out and really marvel at Brit's drumming. Um, he is quite the uh, quite the rhythm keeper. So check out the links. I have some links to other videos that you should check out about the band uh, in the Down Under. And also, uh, please check out... Oh, there is one other thing I wanted to mention. Even though what I showed you in terms of, you know, the EP and then the release, Spiderland, and then the release of Tweez, that's their entire catalog. Um, they did, in fact, uh, in 2014, I think it was, I got some note here on here. Um, yeah, what is it? Yeah, 2014, a box set um, was released of Spiderland that included the, you know, the original songs, but also a lot of other unreleased material, different versions and different recordings and some live recordings as well. It uh, turned into 3,138 hand-numbered box sets that sold out before it was even released. And they're available on the second and market, uh, but roughly it looks like when they show up, they're going for about 150 to 200 dollars which if you if you think of um well it's yeah it's still pretty pricey i don't know if i'm i'm gonna buy the box set i mean for all practical uh practical pur purposes i uh I have their entire catalog, but I suppose if I really wanted to be a completist, I would need to get that box set. Um, which, you know, hey, if any of you have the box set, certainly leave a comment in the down under. Let me know what you think of the box set, particularly uh, regarding the other unreleased songs. And uh, check out the other videos, uh, the links there that, that go with this vinyl in the mail edition. And I hope you enjoyed it. Please share. Uh, please like. Uh, please let me know that you're, you're out there. And most importantly, however, is to remember, always enjoy your music.